It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Good morning. Um, my first question this morning is to the Premier. Families are watching with growing concern as more and more Ontarians are get, uh, becoming ill with COVID-19. Uh, yet after months of suggesting that the government had a plan, the Premier had nothing to say at all yesterday about protecting students in schools, about seniors in long-term care and protecting them, uh, about helping working moms and dads caught in long, waiting, uh, in long lines waiting for COVID-19 tests. Families need to see immediate action and investment by this government. Instead, we're a day late and $6 billion short. Why is the Premier, yet again, so unprepared? Government House Leader to reply. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, opposition for the question. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have been prepared and continue to be prepared uh, to, uh, to fight COVID-19 across the province of Ontario. That includes significant investments in, uh, in public health. That includes significant investments in, uh, uh, in testing. We understand how important it is to the people of the province of Ontario that their health and safety is protected. Not only are we investing in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in health care, but the, the Minister of Education has made significant investments uh, to ensure that our students uh, are safe, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, has been working very closely uh, uh, within her industry to make sure that uh, our long-term care homes are ready. And of course, the, the Minister of Government and Consumer Services has been uh, ensuring that uh, uh, some of the shortages that we had in, uh, in PPE uh, are certainly not the case uh, going forward. So we are prepared. We are ready, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. And, uh, and I thank the, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition for a question. Supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier spent much of last year cutting our public health system, hospitals and our schools. Those cuts left us scrambling to deal with COVID-19 in the spring. In July, the government claimed they were planning a second wave, planning rather for a second wave of the pandemic. But they refused to make the needed investment, Speaker. They refused to make the needed investments in schools. They failed to create a testing regime that could withstand a second wave. And our long-term care homes tell us that they are not ready. They are telling us that they are not ready, regardless of what the Premier and the Ministers say. Is the Premier actually prepared to take the urgent action that's necessary to get this province in gear when it comes to the second wave of COVID-19? And if so, when is he going to do it? Government House Leader. Again, I, I thank the honourable member for uh, for the question. This government has been seized with uh, ensuring the safety of the people of the province of Ontario uh, with its COVID action plan right from the beginning. It started in March when uh, we moved aggressively to uh, uh, to bring forward uh, public safety measures uh, to protect the people of the province of Ontario. It resulted in uh, uh, the closure of much of the economy. The honourable member uh, uh, will know, but significant investments were made in, in health care. Significant investments have made have been made in uh, in testing. We, in fact, lead the nation in terms of uh, of testing. Our response has been one of the best responses in North America, Mr. Mr. Speaker. We should be very proud of that. At the same time, we understand how important it is to keep our students safe. We understand how important it is to learn lessons from the first wave with respect to our long-term care homes, and we've moved very aggressively to do that. We understand how important it is to make sure that we have a Made in Ontario access to to PPE, Once. Mr. Speaker, and we have done that, and we are going to continue to ramp up uh, testing. It is important. Obviously, we all want the people of the province of Ontario to be safe, and we will continue to do all that we can and, and spare no expense in doing so. The final supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect, here's a reality check. As one health per expert put it yesterday, this is time for the full court press on all fronts. It's time to go. In other words, health experts are very worried that this, this government's uh, actions are lagging behind, lagging behind when it comes to the severity of the crisis in front of us. We need investment and we need action, and we needed it yesterday. The president of Ontario's Hospital Association says this, Speaker, and I quote, the hospital sector labs cannot sustain testing under these conditions. The system is heading for a crash. 
Long-term care homes say, and I quote again, homes are not currently ready to manage a second wave. That's the reality check. Schools are scrambling to meet students' needs and operate safely. Will the Premier finally admit that he either has no plan or the one that he apparently has isn't working? Government House Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is a plan. The plan that we've put in place which is, is a plan that leads North America in terms of protecting its people. And I'm very proud of that, uh, Mr. Speaker. But did we learn from parts of the first phase? Absolutely. We learned that we had to have a made in Ontario source of PPE. All jurisdictions were fighting that battle. This Premier stepped up to the plate and made sure that going forward we have access to PPE right here in the province of Ontario. We learned that we had to increase testing capacity, and we have done that across every region of this, uh, of this province. We're increase, increasing testing capacity, Mr. Speaker. It is good news that people are going to be tested. Uh, we understand that as kids go back to school that there will be raising concern, and that's why across every region in this province, testing will be, uh, will be increased. The Minister of Long-Term Care has been working non-stop, day and night, to make sure that our long-term care homes are prepared. I'm told that some 99 percent of our homes right now are not in an outbreak and that we have some response? of the stringent, stringent uh, 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 responses when it is, Mr. Speaker. So I'm very proud of what we've done. That doesn't mean that there isn't more work to do, and we will continue to spare no expense to make sure the people of this province are safe. Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. You, Speaker, my next question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care, but I can tell you all those folks that are waiting literally hours on end and being turned away don't think the testing story in Ontario is good news. Uh, but my question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Our loved ones in long-term care face the greatest risk as the second wave of this pandemic grows. Yesterday, even as the Minister of Long-Term Care was dismissing concerns about the risk facing seniors in long-term care, just as the government House Leader just did, Ottawa's Medical Officer of Health was ordering a takeover of two for-profit facilities where the pandemic has claimed 11 lives since August. Homes themselves say that they are not ready for the second wave. When will the Premier and this minister take action and make the investments necessary so that staff, residents and their own experts uh, can know that the government is actually taking their advice? Because up until this point, it sure seems as if the government is not taking the advice of staff and experts and residents and family members. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, our government's priority is the safety and well-being of residents and staff in long-term care. There is no doubt about that, and I have always acknowledged the, the vulnerability of our residents in long-term care. I have been in contact with the Chief Med uh, the Medical Officer of Health in Ottawa over the past weeks on a regular basis to understand what more we can do for our homes that are hard hit right now in Ottawa. I, I appreciate the support and the actions by the Medical Officer of Health that we have worked in conjunction to achieve, uh, to have the hospitals going into the, the homes that are affected and providing additional support. It is a, an expedient way to uh, provide this through the Health Promotion and Protections Act, and our government will continue to work with our partners, whether it's the Medical Officer of Health, whether it's the Ontario Long-Term Care Association, Advantage Ontario, our long-term care sector, Response. hearing from resident councils, hearing from uh, family councils. We will continue to work and endeavour to make sure that our residents and staff are safe. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Your families uh, are not reassured, frankly, by the uh, minister and this government's uh, empty words and empty promises when it comes to long-term care. While the minister has insisted that 99% of homes are not in outbreak, government documents filed at the Premier's own Long-Term Care Commission show that 149 homes, nearly 25%, are classified as high risk. Now, I find it pretty bizarre that the minister doesn't know what to do. It means what she needs to do is get more PSWs. She needs higher ratio of staff to patients or to, to residents. She needs to do the things that have already been clearly identified need to be done to fix our long-term care system. But look, when asked to make the details of that report of the high-risk homes available, the government refused. They're refusing to let people know where those high-risk homes are. Question. So will the Premier today, will the Minister today, 
Make that information public. Tell us which homes are high risk so that people can be prepared. Mr. Long-term care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, we've said before in this chamber, and I've said before in this chamber, that the high-risk situation uh, of our homes varies depending on where the hot spots are in the province, the, the staffing <coughs> issues, and this is something that we are constantly monitoring. And my ministry, our government, has been entirely focused on making sure that our long-term care homes, our staff and residents get the support they need. And we're working in three stages. Really the emergency response, as there are flare-ups uh, across the province, and, and and addressing those in a timely way. As you, as you have seen with the Medical Officer of Health uh, in Ottawa, that relationship and those ongoing efforts that we collaborate on to make sure our homes get the support they need is, is really cr critical. The stabilization plans for the staffing for our, our PSWs and other staff in long-term care homes is ongoing. It was informed by an expert Response. panel, and we're taking action on that, and also looking at the modernization, the capacity issues that were so badly neglected. This is continuing. We are continuing in COVID speed to, to keep our staff and residents safe in long-term care. And the final supplementary. Speaker, in the spring, while the Premier was promising that there was an iron ring around long-term care, 1800, over 1,850 residents have died in long-term care from COVID-19. Now, this minister and the Premier are insisting that experts, frontline staff, and even operators of long-term care homes themselves are wrong when they say that they are not ready for the second wave. It is not myself, Speaker, as the leader of the official opposition that is making these claims. It is the homes themselves that are saying to the government, you haven't helped us get ready for the second wave of COVID-19. And now there's a list of, of high-risk homes uh, that uh, are, are at risk for outbreaks, and yet they refuse to share the information. So will the Premier and this minister admit that this crisis actually needs urgent action and urgent investment? Stop hiding the facts from the public and implement the recommendations of his own experts to save lives in long-term care. That 11 more people have is absolutely unacceptable. Absolutely. Members will please take their seat. Order. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Mr. Speaker, uh, and thank you for the question. I I'm going to repeat that 99% of our homes uh, have no resident cases and are, are managing very well, and our attention is on the ones that are having difficulties, making sure that we layer on additional supports for them. And the $243 million and the $45 million that has flowed to help homes with their IPAC. But I'd like to, to mention a, a, a quote from the September 21st joint letter by OLTCA Advantage CanAge, OLTC Clinicians, Family Councils Ontario, and the Ontario Association of Resident Councils. Your government's response in wave one with the launch of the long-term care action plan was critical in helping our long-term care homes fend off and contain COVID-19. So I do take exception to your characterization. These measures, Order. the quote Order. continues, these measures have improved our home's readiness for the next wave. And, uh, and I want to, you know, impart to you, Member Bonds. Opposite, that there is a difference now compared to wave one and it encompasses many different things that we've learned over the span of time and our health experts and our scientific experts so we're listening we're listening across the board to our sector to residents to families and to our scientific experts thank you order the next question the member for waterloo Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. As families across the province line up five, six, even eight hours with thousands of potentially sick people to get their tests, the Premier declared that he was perfectly okay with a new private company that plans to offer people testing at home for a price. The Premier says it's a free market society. Speaker, through you to the Premier. We know the Conservatives wish that we had an American-style two-tier health care system, just as the Minister of Long-Term Care. But does the Premier really think that families should Order. have to pay $400 for this government's failure to plan? The government House Leader. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for, for the question. I'll remind the honourable member that it was actually a progressive conservative government that brought in socialized medicine here in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and we're very proud of that. Since coming to office, we've made historic investments in, in health and long-term care. Uh, many of the problems that, uh, that we inherited we, from uh, the previous 15 years of uh, the Liberal NDP uh, coalition in this place, we have started to address, whether that's providing additional resources for our long-term care homes. When it comes to COVID-19, we have spent no expense in preparing the province of Ontario, and that includes testing. Uh, that includes testing, Mr. Speaker. Across every region of this province, we have increased the capacity for testing, and we are going to continue to do so in our fall preparedness plan, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of the people who work in healthcare across this uh, this province. They have done a spectacular job in making sure that Ontario is amongst the safest jurisdictions in North America in which to live, work, and to raise a family. And I'm proud of that record. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the last time I asked a testing question in this House was six months ago. What has this government learned? The Premier's plan does not do enough to prioritize the needs of families across the province. In Waterloo Region, lineups for testing have gotten so bad that the police were called. I heard from a student who has taken transit to the testing centre four days in a row, and still they have not been able to get tested. And this morning, the, the testing facility in KW was full for the day at 7.15 a.m. People arrived at 3 o'clock in the morning. People can't afford to spend hundreds of dollars and sometimes days waiting for a COVID-19 test. Speaker, does the Premier expect everyday Ontarians to shell out hundreds of extra dollars for a private COVID test when they can barely afford to take the day off in the first place? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I, I, again, I'm not sure where the, the member has been. Uh, the Premier outlined yesterday, as did the Minister of Health, the significant investments that we are making in testing across every region in this, in this province. Order. Massively increasing testing capacity uh, because we know how important it is not only to ensure that people ha are, have the confidence that they are safe in their community. The official opposition come to order. It is that our educators feel safe, that our students feel safe, that our economy continues to, uh, to be working. And it's that re it is because of that why we've made such investments in, in testing. We have tested more than any other province combined. Ontario is doing order. more tests than all other provinces combined. I think that is something that we should be proud of. Does more have to be done? Absolutely. If the one thing that we are learning through this COVID, uh, uh, COVID crisis is that you can never let up, that you always have to be prepared and expect the worst, and that's what this government has been doing since day one, sparing no expense in making sure that Ontario remains the best place in which to live, work, invest, and raise a family, and ultimately we'll make Response. sure that the people of the province of Ontario are safe because that's our obligation. Stop the clock. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry must come to order. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services must come to order. The Member for Windsor West will come to order. The Leader of the Opposition will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the Member for Mississauga Centre. Merci, Monsieur le... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Francophone Affairs. The Franco Francophone community contribute to our economy and to our culture for over 400 years. Friday on the 27th, 25th of September, we will celebrate Franco-Ontarian Day with all members of the community, including Francophiles. COVID-19 has been a great challenge for all Ontarians. How has the government supported the Francophone community throughout this crisis? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague from Mississauga Centre for her question. Since the beginning of the pandemic, in the month of March, we worked very hard and we collaborated with the Francophone community to meet its needs, whether it was the implementation of a, a committee to relaunch uh, the economy and with a specific focus on the Francophone community. The announce, announcement of the health team in Ottawa East and the simultaneous translation of uh, the Premier's press conferences. I was also proud to announce $500,000 yesterday for a francophone fund in order to promote uh, francophone businesses. These are two initiatives 
that are following recommendations in terms of relaunching the economy and specifically with uh, the Francophone community in mind. Thank you, Madam Minister, for your response. It's great news and thank you for everything that you're doing for the Francophone community. You mentioned the announcement of $500 million from yesterday. What does this announcement mean for small businesses in the Francophone community? The Minister, thank you for your question. We understand the importance of developing the economy for the Francophone community. The network that will provide a virtual platform will provide help to entrepreneurs and ensure that we can promote those entrepreneurs and uh, all businesses in the Francophone community to ensure that we can create partnerships and strategic alliances. This fund to promote bus French businesses will expand their visibility beyond Ontario into Quebec and New Brunswick. The need for these initiatives existed before the pandemic, and the need is even greater now that we're faced with this very difficult situation. We're acting in a very proactive manner, presenting concrete measures so that Franco-Ontarians can be prosperous and continue to contribute to our province, our economy, and to the, our culture. Okay. Member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care and hopes to get an answer today. Earlier this week, when asked about protections for workers at West End Villa, the Minister of Long-Term Care said, and I quote, I can assure this chamber and Ontarians that West End Villa has the PPE it requires, including N95s available to the staff to use." End quote. But yesterday, workers on the front lines of this devastating outbreak bravely came forward to clarify that this is simply not the case. Despite claims from the government and their private for-profit operator friends at Extended Care, workers are now saying that this vital PPE is available to some employees, but not to others. Why is the information peddled by the Minister of Long-Term Care so widely different than of the workers on the front lines of this pandemic? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. First of all, I want to recognize the dedication and the commitment and the compassion that our frontline workers bring every single day to our long-term care homes and residents. I have been in regular contact uh, with the Ottawa Hospital, who is involved in supporting these two homes, and I have received assurances that the, the N95 masks are available to our staff in those homes. I have been seeking uh, to make sure that this is, uh, these are available to our staff. In, I, I say our staff because I consider all the people working in long-term care to be serving Ontarians, uh, that it is available uh, in the homes. So I have had reassurances. I will double back and I will make sure that that is accurate information. But I want to Response. remind everyone here that we have developed a uh, procurement process for masks that is unlike anything this, his, this province has ever seen to make sure that our, our staff and residents are protected in the way that is necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Speaker, what's disappointing is that this uh, minister hasn't actually acknowledged what we've been questioning this last uh, week and a half about it. The second wave of the pandemic is here, and we are already reliving the horrors of the first wave in our long-term care homes. To date, the horrifying outbreak at Extended Care West End Villa has infected 23 staff, 37 residents, and, the, and claimed the lives of 11 other residents. Workers in these homes are laying their lives on the line to care for our vulnerable seniors, and each and every one of them should be able to freely access PPEs they need to stay safe and do their job. When will the workers at West End Villa be given the PPE that they deserve and need to survive the deadly outbreak? 
Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the, for the question. If we look at really the difference between Wave 1 and Wave 2, there are multiple. And the first really is the PPE, that the availability of the PPE and the supplies of the PPE are, are much more secure. And the, and the staff in these homes uh, do have access to the N95s. And as I said, I will, I will make sure that we have that information. It is, as it is confirmed to me by people on the ground and the hospital assisting the, the, this home. But if we look at the testing as well, the surveillance testing done in our homes, the acknowledgement of asymptomatic spread within the elderly and long-term care homes. These are, these are differences from wave one. And we can say with accuracy that those are making a difference. We're picking up cases of staff through this testing process so that it's not coming in Bonds. to the home. And in only a very tiny percentage of homes are affected. And my heart goes out to all the residents and staff and their families who are affected. And we will continue to do everything possible to ensure this, their safety. That is our... Thank you. <laughs> Next question, member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Your speakers, my question is for the Premier. It's time that this government begins to be truthful and honest. For seven months, the public has been fed... A... Member will take a seat. And a caution him on his language. Did you hear me? I will caution the member on his language that he's going to use. Place your question. Some real, some probable, and some imaginary. Although the elderly who are sick and frail are at a high risk to COVID, the rest of the population is not. Unlike the repeated messages of panic from this government, we do find clarity in other jurisdictions. Dr. Lawrence Rosenberg, Montreal's medical officer, has stated, and I quote, this COVID virus is much like the seasonal flu. A group of over 400 Belgian doctors have stated, and I quote, COVID is not a killer virus, but a treatable condition. 18 Canadian doctors wrote the Premier, and I quote, your policies risk significantly harming our children with lifelong consequences. Speaker, to Question. the Premier, will you start being honest about the risk of COVID? I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Government House Leader to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Respectfully, I disagree with just about everything the member said. Supplementary question. Again to the Premier. Our Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Health has stated our testing results are over 50% false positives, yet we keep testing, knowing full well that the results are near meaningless. Another group of Australian doctors have spoken out, and I quote, ordinary sensible people, if properly informed, will inevitably conclude that the government's policies are ill-focused, heavy-handed, and unjustifiable. But your government keeps creating new restrictions. A group of UK doctors have stated, and I quote, the objective of virus suppression is unfeasible and is leading to harm across all age groups. But the government limits access to our health care system, putting everyone at risk. Speaker, Excellent. I believe that this government has caused enough harm. And uh, to the Premier, why are you using COVID as an election campaign strategy to the, at the cost of health, free. Member will take a seat. The next question, member for Haldeman Norfolk. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. <laughs> question for the uh, uh, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. And as we know, here in Ontario, we have a thriving resource-based tourism sector in normal times. We draw tourists from around the world to come for the pristine wilderness in the northern parts of our province. Hunters and anglers spend more than $560 million and $1.6 billion, respectively, each year in Ontario to support jobs in many of our rural and northern communities. We know that a disease that takes hold in animal population can upset the balance in an ecosystem, threaten the safety of our food supply, and hurt businesses and livelihoods for many who work in agriculture, hunting, and resource-based tourism. Minister, 
What is our government doing to ensure that we are on top of this threat posed by disease in our wildlife populations? <coughs> the Minister of Natural Resources. Well, thank, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the uh, great member from Halban Norfolk for that question. And he's right to the point on the importance of monitoring livestock and wild animals. Our government gets it. We represent people in every corner of the province and understand the interconnectedness of our ecosystems and our economy. The health of our wildlife and rural economies affects the food supply chain for people in cities from Ottawa to Toronto and Windsor. Earlier this year, we took action to further protect wildlife populations from chronic wasting disease, CWD, and ensure continued hunting opportunities in the province. CWD is a progressive, fatal disease that affects members of the cervid family, deer, elk, moose, and caribou. Speaker, I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, uh, Minister, for that response. And you know, it's one thing to say we're on top of things when the going is good, but it's great to hear that we're being vigilant with respect to this threat of uh, chronic wasting disease and uh, other similar diseases. I was pleased to find out that in Ontario we've tested over uh, 13,000 deer and elk over the past two decades. All the tests have been negative. As we know, you can never take things for granted, and there have been cases in neighboring jurisdictions, in neighboring states, and neighboring provinces. So my question uh, to the Minister Speaker is, what are we doing here in Ontario to ensure that we continue to keep our survey population safe? Thank you. Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you again to the uh, member for the question. And I have uh, attended the uh, testing facility at Trent University in Peterborough as well to see the great work they do. While C CWD has not been detected in Ontario, as you say, it is important to remain vigilant. CWD was discovered in 2018 on a deer farm in Quebec close to the Ontario border and has been found in all five states bordering Ontario. In December 2019, our government announced a CWD prevention and response plan to ensure approaches are in place to minimize the risk of the disease entering or spreading within our province. Additionally, this summer we proposed to prohibit the import of live captive cervids from outside the province in most circumstances. The newly proposed changes would enhance protections that are already in place. These measures will protect Ontario's wildlife and support sustainable Response. hunting, which creates jobs and makes an important economic contribution to our province. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, I think we can all agree that we are living through some scary times right now. But one thing that people can count on to calm our anxiety is our public health care system. We all know that we can count on our hospital to care for us, not just for COVID, but for all the health challenges that we face. Since the beginning of the pandemic, it has been all hands on deck for every health care worker. And with a looming second wave, the demand on our health care system will continue to increase. But now we've learned that 97 nurses will be laid off in South Lake Hospital in Newmarket. I know the Premier likes to cut expenditure, but in the middle of a pandemic, how can he justify laying off 97 nurses from the front line? The government House Leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm not going to specifically con uh, 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 comment on uh, negotiations between the hospital and, uh, and its staff, I will say this. The member is absolutely correct. Uh, uh, health care and, uh, and the provision of health care services are incredibly important. It's one of the most important things that government can do, and that's why we've made significant investments. In fact, we've increased the budget to the largest that it's ever been in Ontario history. I think what the Minister of Health had, has been doing since the beginning, transitioning our health care system to Ontario health teams so that we could get uh, care, uh, a ribbon of care, so that whether you are in home care, whether you are in long-term care, needing access to a family doctor or to the hospital, that care is available to you. It's easier to access 
uh, Mr. Speaker. And that means that means providing more services where people need it most in the community, uh, uh, Speaker. So I'm proud of the work that we've done. And let me just say, South Lake is an incredible hospital. I've had uh, uh, I've used it on a number of occasions, both myself and my family. The nurses and staff there are are, are, uh, are exceptional, and I know all of us in York Region are grateful for the work that they do. Thank you. And the supplementary question again, the member for Nickel Belt. It gets worse, Speaker. According to the nurses at the hospital, the layoff of 97 frontline nurses is based on a best case scenario based on the province actual funding. Let that sink in, Speaker. New Market could lose over a hundred frontline nurses. Now, more than ever, the Premier should ensure that our hospital have the resources they need to deliver the care people need and frankly to save lives. The Premier has a huge role to play in making sure that people trust our health care system and that trust does not get eroded. Should I remind the Premier of baby Sophia, who was sent home from that hospital only to die three days later? Will the Premier do the right thing, protect Ontario's family, and ensure that these 97 nurses will be there to care for us and don't get laid off? Again, Mr. Speaker, we move very quickly as a government to ensure that the resources were in place for our, uh, our health care uh, uh, professionals. That includes an increase of over $5 million for South Lake. But as the member knows, it's not just about money. It's about how we access uh, uh, quality care. Myself and my own family were seeking uh, uh, assistance for a father-in-law who needs to get from, uh, uh, from radiation treatment, needs home care, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it has been very difficult and challenging to to access all of these services, even for somebody who's been in public service for many, many years. The changes that the minister is making, the changes that this government is making, will mean that it is easier for people to access care that they need, whether it is home care, whether it is long-term care, whether it is a test, whether it is uh, 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 access to a hospital, Mr. Speaker. That's why we are making these changes. Nurses are vital to this. That's why the Minister of Education with the Minister of Health have been hiring more nurses for our, our, our education system. System, Mr. Speaker. We value the work that nurses do. We can't run a system without them, and there is going to be continued investments to make sure that all Ontarians have access to the highest quality care that this province can provide. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Long-term care. I recently had the privilege of convening a panel of medical experts in Ontario to explore how long-term care homes have responded to COVID-19 in order to identify what improvement should be prioritized going forward to ensure a better protection for our seniors. This forum was really well attended and very informative. This panel is in the process of producing a report, which I will be very happy to share with the minister. Unfortunately, we were surprised to learn that there is no mechanism for sharing this important research with the ongoing Long-Term Care Commission. Given the wide-reaching consequences of COVID-19, it is important that we ensure that the Commission hears important contributions from medical experts and communities from across the province. The Ministry of Long-Term Care established the terms of reference for this Commission. Sure. Why was a meaningful process for consulting the public not included in these terms of reference? Questions to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. The terms of reference uh, for the Commission are very broad and comprehensive. They have a website uh, that is available to provide information uh, and update the public and any other group that's interested. I've been very clear, our government has been very clear that this is an independent um, commission. Uh, they have the ability to uh, um, summon individuals. They have the ability to have public hearings and they will issue a public report, but it is their decision. Uh, they are, they, we, the ministry does not have um, uh, ability to influence them in any way. They are independent. And I think this is a very important point that seems to be forgotten, that as a minister, we have three very capable um, and, and um, respected commissioners, and they have started their Spons. work already. So we have uh, a process, they have a website. Uh, please reach out uh, and use the link available. Uh, but this is an independent commission. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Long-Term Care. 
while we must protect the independence of the Commission and respect the expertise of the panel, it is equally important to have a framework to allow the Commission to conduct its inquest fully. Nowhere on the website can we find information about public meetings or any way to make submissions to the Commission. In order to make an inquest fully, it requires ensuring that the mandate includes a clear process for being able to solicit input from Ontario's medical professionals and hear about the different ways that COVID-19 has affected Ontario diverse communities' long-term care. Under the Commission Terms of Reference, the Minister has the discretion to make amendments to the Commission to ensure that it may conduct its inquest comprehensively and accurately in avoiding the perception that the work is being done behind closed door without hearing from the public experience. Question. Will the Minister use this discretion to include a clear and well-defined process for consulting the public in order to allow experts producing helpful research on this exact issue to submit this research to assist the Commission inquiry? Thank you. Again, Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you again. And, and it's, it's, it's very clear that the reason the, the Independent Commission was established was to do exactly that, was to understand what happened, to hear from, from individuals and organizations, and investigate how COVID-19 spread within long-term care homes, how residents, staff, and families were impacted, and the adequacy of the measures that were taken by the province and other parties to prevent, isolate, and contain the spread. It's very clear. Our government is being transparent about this process. The terms of reference are comp uh, comprehensive and wide, and they do have the power to, to, to do the things you mentioned. So the, the intent from this government is to provide an independent commission. It is independent. And they have three highly respected commissioners, one uh, very uh, respected in, uh, in government, the other in the health field, CEO of, of the Ottawa Hospital, also looking, also looking at... Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister responsible for small business and red tape reduction. In my riding of Perth, Wellington, COVID-19 has forced many businesses in the riding to adapt to the new business climate. Every day I get phone calls from struggling small business owners. With COVID-19, we know that we're facing an unprecedented challenge. Businesses are facing unique problems created by this, the global pandemic. They need help from the government to adopt to this new environment. Business owners in Ontario aren't looking for handouts. They're looking for just a little help to get back on their feet. Minister, can you please tell me how our government is supporting businesses as they respond to the challenges caused by COVID-19? The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Perth Wellington for that question. Our government has taken a number of steps to help, number of steps to help the small businesses respond to COVID-19. We have provided at the onset $10 billion in provincial tax deferrals, workplace safety and insurance board uh, premium deferrals, and other business supports. We have provided over $900 million uh, in urgent relief to small businesses and to help uh, with their rental payments. Mr. Speaker, we have helped over 54,000 businesses receive rental support through this program. We have made uh, investments to help businesses go digital, a $57 million uh, investment in Digital Main Street, the largest investment uh, in the history of this country to help businesses go digital. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have launched Tackling Response. the Barriers web portal to help businesses pivot and support them during this very difficult time. Well, sir, and a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and through you to the uh, Minister, I want to thank the Minister for that answer. Economic growth and job creation will be key priorities as we get back, uh, as we get our economy back to where it was before. Businesses need the support to survive, that, but also thrive and continue growing after we get through this pandemic. Can the Associate Minister please tell his House how our government can get our economy back to where it was before the pandemic hit? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our Made in Ontario plan for growth, renewal, and economic recovery will bring us back and make us stronger than ever before. In July, our government passed the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act. 
This piece of legislation is helping restart thousands of jobs, attracting new investments, and is helping businesses adapt to the new environment, making Ontario a modern regulator, one that communicates clearly and operates effectively will free up our people and businesses to focus on what is most important, recovering and re-emerging stronger than ever before. The pandemic has reinforced the need to take stronger action to make regulations better for people and smarter for business, and that's exactly what we are doing. We are going to continue to modernize outdated regulations, remove duplication, and minimize costs for business. And we're going to continue to work with our businesses to ensure that they can rebuild, rehire, and reemerge stronger than ever before. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, my question is to the Minister of Education. Uh, my office has heard from many alarmed parents, including Kimberly, and they all attest to the same thing. As more students are being kept home, local school boards are collapsing classes making them larger without social distancing. We have heard of classes with three or four grades in them, with less than one meter between desks, without adequate safety. In Kimberly's case, the child's school went from 13 to 11 classes. Now, the minister has said that this is being done by school boards, but he can direct those boards. It is within his power to cap all class sizes at 15 and provide the funding so that we have safe schools in Ontario right now. The current approach, signed off by this minister, is clearly not working and it is endangering the lives of people in Ontario. With outbreaks in dozens, Speaker, dozens of schools in Ottawa, will the minister commit right now to limiting students in the class at all ages to 15 students per class? Why are there crowded, crowded classrooms when the teachers have been hired, the money has already been allocated, and the classrooms are sitting empty. The Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the plan that we unveiled in this province has been fully endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer for Health. Moms and dads of this province can have confidence that it has been informed by the best medical and pediatric science this country has. We have worked every step of the way to build up capacity, to introduce layers of prevention to mitigate the spread and the risk within our schools. We are cognizant, Speaker that the risk in our school really is reflective of the risk within our community, which is the basis for why yesterday the Minister of Health, the Premier, announced the largest uh, uh, flu vaccination campaign in Ontario's history, $70 million to procure 700,000 more vaccines for more young people, particularly for our kids. Very important to help mitigate the spread. We've taken action to hire more custodians, to improve ventilation, and obviously to hire more teachers to reduce the classroom sizes in all boards, including in Limestone, including in Algonquin Lakeshore, including in Sept Destin, Ontario, and all of the boards where the members are riding opposite there, having receiving more funding to ensure those classes are as safe as humanly possible. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's not enough funding to only have 15 students per class, and that is exactly what they need. Three days ago, there were three outbreaks in Ottawa. Today, it is 38. Your plan is not working no matter who signed off on it. Tackling a pandemic is about the management of risk. It is about taking every action that anyone can possibly can to move that needle to a little less risk, which means that for every classroom that only has 15 students in it, we have less risk of an outbreak. Every time you commit to a 15-person classroom, you're helping to protect more people in this province. And the minister knows this. I can only imagine that the minister weighed the risks of a 30-person classroom versus 15 and found out that he thinks it's an acceptable level of risk to pack 30 students into a classroom. Will the minister commit to 15 student classrooms in every class in Ontario right now? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. In the, in the words of the Ottawa Catholic District School Board Chair, they have the smallest classroom sizes in the history of that board this year because of government funding, because we've helped support the unlocking of reserve funds together, provincial, federal, and boards, ensuring that they have the capacity to do more hiring. 
well north of 2,600 teachers are being hired because of the funding we've provided. In various school boards, the challenge is not access to funding, as, an, as, uh, as acknowledged by Toronto District School Board yesterday. It's an access to supply of educators, in fact, Speaker. But nonetheless, in Ottawa, we're seeing classroom sizes in junior kindergarten and senior kindergarten averaging 22, well below the provincial average pre-COVID, one to three at 17.6, well below the provincial average before COVID, and likewise for grades 40 to 22.2, also below the average. In every board, funding is flowing to ensure that it is safe. I've spoken to Dr. Uh, Etches as well as the leadership of the medical team Response. in Ottawa as recently as this weekend with the aim to work with them to ensure we reduce the risk and improve the safety of our schools in Ottawa and across our province. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, at the outset of COVID-19, it was clear to everyone in the province and really across the country that a significant response was required to ensure that frontline workers had the PPE that they required. We were reminded daily on the news that the global market for critical personal protective equipment and medical supplies was highly constrained. Could the Minister of Government and Consumer Services please tell the House what actions the government is taking to ensure that Ontario's frontline workers have the PPE that they need? Great question. The Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the hard-working member from Niagara West for that question, because my colleague is rightly so in pointing out the immense challenge that our government was presented with to ensure Ontario had a solid supply of PPE and other critical supplies as well. Our government took immediate action to ensure that we have had the sufficient critical supplies needed to protect our vulnerable groups and essential services. And I must say, Speaker, given the Premier's expertise in supply chain management, he led by example, and our government mobilized the procurement specialists to rapidly leverage existing partnerships so that all Ontarians working in the broader public service and the education sector excuse me, have a consistent supply of quality products to meet their needs. We also employed innovative solutions, Speaker. With Minister Fideli, we put out the call to Ontario businesses to help us address COVID through the Ontario Together portal. And as a result, we've had thousands of businesses across this province reach out and add their assistance in helping protect our frontline workers. Thank you. And the supplementary. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for her work on this important file. I'm certain that these actions have helped in our fight against COVID-19. And I know I've also seen across the province, as well as at, uh, in Niagara West, uh, in a homegrown local industry uh, for local protective equipment being built. And I think it's very, very important for the future sustainability of our entire uh, health and protective equipment ecosystem. Our frontline heroes rightly want to know that the supplies that they are being provided are procured from reputable sources and are being made of safe quality materials. So, Speaker, could the minister please tell the House what the government has been doing to ensure that the PPE which is being used and which has been procured by the government is, in fact, safe for use? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I can tell you nothing is more important than the safety of Ontarians, and that brings all of us together in this House. And it's a principle that we hold above all else when it comes to procurement. Ontarians can be assured that all the products that we have purchased, both domestic and at the foreign level, have Health Canada's approval. Over and above that, we have worked with partners around the world to undertake in inspections of overseas facilities. This is to ensure that the manufacturing of critical supplies and PPE that we can't access locally are safely manufactured, because again, safety comes first. Mr. Speaker, all the products undergo a rigorous quality insurance process once it arrives here in this province in our warehouse, again, whether it's domestically manufactured or at the foreign level. And we Response. want to ensure that they are safe and effective for our frontline workers. And I'd just like to take this moment to thank all of our officials in government and consumer services. We have them in Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, Ontarians were shocked when the Premier's promised COVID-19 second wave plan turned out to be even more delay tactics. Though deep within yesterday's no actual plan press release was a line that read, and I quote, recruit, re retain, train and support health care workers while also continuing to engage families and caregivers. Families laughed at that comment, Speaker, because they haven't been engaged at all. 
As the Premier knows, this Conservative government hasn't supported health care workers and has continued to prevent residents in long-term care, group homes and all congregate care settings from accessing essential caregivers during the pandemic. Many seniors and people with disabilities have suffered mentally, physically and emotionally in isolation for six months, unable to receive the direct love, care and support from their family and caregivers. The harm that has been done in some cases is irreversible. Question. Can the Premier confirm that his yet-to-be-seen second-wave plan will ensure that no resident in congregate care is denied meaningful, consistent access to their essential caregivers going forward? Government House Leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the question. The minister, obviously, or the uh, the member, obviously raises some very important points. As part of the one of the things that we saw. Uh, through the initial first waves was how difficult this uh, this pandemic has been on on families and uh, uh, and and caregivers uh, quite frankly especially those who are in long-term care uh, in long-term care centers and in conjugate care centers I will say in my own riding at participation house we certainly had a a, a challenging time but uh, uh, first and foremost with the hard work of uh, the Minister of children community uh, uh, services uh, we were able to address address that uh, going forward obviously we've uh, we've learned a lot of the lessons from uh, from the first wave and the government will be putting in place uh, uh, continued measures to ensure the health and safety of all of those whether they're in conjugate care and long-term care or quite frankly those uh, uh, those health care professionals who are working in the community response and visiting, uh, uh, whether they be seniors or other uh, 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 people who need uh, care in their homes. So yes, we are listening, and we do appreciate how hard it has been for uh, for the people of the province of Ontario. But stick with us; we're continuing to work hard. For you. On the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's great that the government house leader can appreciate how hard it's been. What the people need is for him to actually do something about it. Last week, I tabled a bill called the More Than a Visitor Act. The bill is a legislative solution to this crucial issue of access to essential caregivers. It would do three things, Speaker. One, it would enshrine rights and protections for residents in congregate care, including the right to consistent, meaningful access to their caregivers. Two, it would ensure the government provides the resources, staffing, infection prevention and control training, and supplies to safely facilitate this. Three, it sets out parameters for the development of a provincial caregiver strategy created in consultation with residents, caregivers, workers, and experts. Speaker, will the Premier commit to truly engaging essential caregivers and families by passing my bill and creating this strategy with residents, caregivers, workers and experts engaged at the table? And I just heard someone, I think the Minister of Community and Social Services, say no. Don't heckle. Do something for these people. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, Speaker, Reply. once again, we're getting misinformation from the member opposite. I did absolutely no response. Okay. Take your seat. Stop the clock. Order. Order. I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw. Yeah, I'll withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Conclude his answer. Thank Sorry. you. You know, it's unfortunate because we've been doing a very good job in dealing with our partners in the developmental services sector since the pandemic began. We've been working very closely with community living organizations, Christian Horizons. I know the Minister of Long-Term Care has been working extremely hard, and in spite of the fact that the member opposite continues to heckle, Mr. Speaker, we have been working extremely hard as the government of Ontario to put guidelines in place that are going to protect those vulnerable people in our group homes, in our congregate care settings, in our long-term care facilities. Yeah. In our violence against women's shelters, we have been working every day, day in and day out, to make sure that we're putting guidelines in place that are going to allow those essential caregivers to get into the homes, to Order. visit their loved ones, while protecting their safety and their health, which is the paramount responsibility of all of us here in government. I hope that the member opposite can realize we are working extremely hard and communicating as best as we can to allow those family Order. members to get in. In June, we allowed them to visit Response. outside. In July, we allowed them to visit in inside and now in August we've allowed them to have short-term overnight stays we're continuing to work with families we're continuing to work with our partners in the sector mr. speaker thank you the next question the member from Markham Union Bill. thank you mr. speaker speaker my question is to the minister of the member for Windsor West will come to order housing. minister last week you introduced legislation that will help small businesses municipalities and renters across Ontario. I know that since the onset of COVID-19, our government has been taking decisive decisions 
to help tenants stay in their homes and pay their rent. Could you please explain to this House what is this legislation would do to help our province renters? Thank you, Minister. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the, the member for Markham Unionville for the question. Uh, he's right. La last week, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, tabling uh, Bill 204, the Helping Tenants and Small Business Act. I did my uh, lead off uh, with my parliamentary assistant and the parliamentary assistant to the Solicitor General this morning. Uh, the bill, if passed, would stabilize uh, rent for Ontario's 1.7 uh, million tenants. As we all know, this year has uh, been incredibly unpredictable, and as we recover, uh, we want tenants uh, to have some certainty regarding uh, this process. Uh, it's why we're investing $510 million with our municipal service managers. We're encouraging them uh, to increase their rent banks and utility banks. That's why this legislation uh, is proposing a rent freeze uh, in Ontario for 2021. The maximum increase for rent-controlled and non-rent-controlled uh, units Response. will be 0%. We want to thank uh, landlords uh, for their patience. Uh, we want to thank tenants for their patience, and together we will get Ontario back on track. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, through you to the Minister. Thank you for your continued advocacy for tenants across our province. I can still remember the great announcement the other day you made, uh, uh, about uh, our senior affordable housing in uh, my riding of Markham Unionville. And I know that the tenants of the my riding of Markham Unionville will appreciate the freeze at a time that many of them are still facing uncertainty. Minister, you have said that multiple times that this rent freeze would apply to the vast majority of tenants. Could you explain what exactly you mean when you say the vast majority? <laughs> Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, thank you uh, sure. Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member. That's a very important question. I, I also want to, uh, because he mentioned it, uh, want to thank him for uh, his work. Uh, we had a great announcement in your riding with Mayor Scarpetti, creating more affordable housing units in your region. And I, again, I want to thank you for hosting me that day and, and everything you do to represent the people in your riding. So when I say the vast majority of, uh, of tenants are going to have a zero percent uh, increase in their rents in 2020. I mean almost every single tenant in the province. We have tenants that are living in rent-controlled units, non-rent-controlled units, retirement homes, land lease communities, from condos in Ottawa to basement apartments uh, in Sudbury. We will have a 0% rent increase in 2021. Now, there will be a few circumstances where tenants can see an increase, and that's when landlords Bonds. have to make costly repairs to units for things like safety and security. I know that landlords and tenants have come together during these unprecedented times, and I want to thank each and every one of them for the work that they do. They're showing the Ontario spirit. Speaker. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being no further business, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.